uh, our theme for the speaker series this semester is this idea of engagement and how we as people who live on Earth can engage with the myriad ways of addressing some of the issues with how we are living on this Earth. Um, and so we're trying to bring in speakers this semester that come at that issue from different ways, from different angles and different directions based on different backgrounds who have had different careers and different ways of thinking about it all. Um, and one of the neat things about our speaker tonight is that she's had really incredible experience in different kinds of organizations working sometimes on like opposite sides of the same issue. Uh, and so she's going to be able to give you guys a little bit of insight tonight into how different kind of groups work on helping the rest of us in the conservation community engage with addressing some uh, really interesting environmental issues that face primarily our oceans and coasts and the things that live on them and the people that defend them um, depend on them. Uh, so it's my pleasure tonight to introduce you to Dr. Latisse Lafere. Let me tell you a little bit about her. <laughs> 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 so I'm going to tell you a little bit about it, um, and then um, I'll, I'll lay down some ground rules. She wants to be interrupted a lot, and and then I'll I'll pass the clicker off to her. Uh, so, Dr. Lafere Matisse uh, currently works as a program officer for the Resources and Legacy Fund. And she's going to tell you about that organization and what they actually do, which is a role that you may not have even realized existed for a, a conservation, not for profit organization. So we're going to learn about what she does in that role. Um, but before she went into that role, she did all kinds of interesting things. Let me just list a few of these. Uh, so she previously was the California Ocean Policy Manager for the Monterey Bay Aquarium, which in addition to keeping a lot of really interesting fish and marine life alive, also is a really mm -hmm. important organization advocating for things like sustainable fisheries, um, other environmental friendly policies like banning plastic bags and stuff at both state and federal levels. And so her job there was to interface with the government of California and the population of California to get them to talk to their government to actually make some change on some important issues. So she's going to tell us a little bit about that. Um, but she's actually spent most of her career in Washington, D.C., um, working on a large part of issues pertaining to the National Marine Sanctuary Program. And has anybody here visited our National Marine Sanctuary? Just Yes, so we'll, we'll find out a little bit more about that program, and which is a federal program, but which is paired with this really interesting partnership with a not-for-profit foundation whose job is to help the federal office do their work. Is that an accurate assessment of that? Right, and so she got to work on both the federal government side and on the foundation side. She's going to give you some insights into how those different entities deal with the same kind of issues. Um, before that, long ago, she uh, was a Canalis Marine Policy Fellow for Congressman Sam Farr, and in that role, she was my predecessor by some numbers of years, which is <laughs> how, we, how we first met a long time ago. Um, she's from an uh, inland state. She's going to talk about this, um, and she'll also probably contest that it's not totally inland because they've got very large lakes. Um, but has grew up with a thing for oceans, which would tell you about. She has um, bachelor's degrees from Brown in both aquatic biology and in English. When you double major, you get two degrees, which is amazing. Um, and then she has her doctorate in marine biology from the University of Delaware. Uh, and along the way, in addition to doing scientific publications and scuba diving all over the world and visiting all seven continents, which is kind of amazing. Um, you also published a book of poetry, which is <laughs> <laughs> um, So it's so awesome that you're here. Thank you. <laughs> so, I, so I just wanted to tell the really quick ground rules. Uh, Latisse would much rather have a dialogue with you than to just stand and talk at you. Um, and so she begs to be interrupted if she says anything that you don't get. If you have a question about anything that she says. So by all means, get a hand up there and get in on this. This is your chance to talk with her. Um, and we thought it would be helpful just to give her a sense of who all is in this room. I thought we could just do a little bit of, of Q&A. Um, and so if the answer is yes, you just, just like stand up. And the answer is no, you can stay in your seat. Um, so if you are a CSUCI student, could you stand up? <laughs> 
so <laughs> most, mostly students. Okay, that's a good sign. Um, if you are uh, an ESRM student, would you stand up? In other words, yeah. if you're not, let me say it again the other way. The other <laughs> student, if you're, if you're not an ESRM class. student, you can sit down. You mean in an ESRM Oh, sorry, class. I mean a major, a major. If you're an ESRM major, make so the clarification. Very I want to write these down in advance. <laughs> So a lot of environmental science majors, if you have taken or are taking an ESRM class, maybe stand up. So lots of ESRM students, <laughs> even if you're not ESRM majors. Um, and I'm curious, as people that aren't ESRM majors and aren't taking an ESRM class, I'm, you just want to yell out, perhaps, what? don't be shy, where, from, Why from whence do you, that's not what I said, from whence do you arrive? What's your major? I am in the credential program. Okay, cool. Teaching credential. Yeah. How about in the, how about in the back? Yes, Ramita. Very say awesome. Anybody else? Sakura, you're political science. Um, business. Okay, so interdisciplinary crowd. Interdisciplinarity <laughs> is one of the mission pillars of this university. So thank you all for coming. Um, don't sit down yet. Uh, if you were born and raised within uh, 10 miles of this university, could you sit down? Oh. Oh. Sit down. Ha. <laughs> sit down. Uh, this is going to get to, I'm confused. So, if you're from 10 miles away, like more than 10 miles away. If you're from more than 10 miles away, if you're, no, uh, I'm blowing it. Uh, I'm trying to get a sense of, th thank you, Monica James. Uh, so if, if you grew up really close, you could sit Sit down. What's really close? Really close, What's 10 miles miles the university. Right here. Uh, I'll say that Oxnard and Ventura are about 10 miles. Uh, if you grew up more than, less than 50 miles from the university, basically like most of LA County, Santa Clara County, if you grew up within 50 miles, you can sit down. Uh. Huntington Beach is probably like 65 miles. <laughs> <laughs> if you grew up, uh, Less than 100 miles from this university, you could sit down. Wow. So if you grew up outside of, if you grew up in the state of California, you can sit down. Oh, oh. Oh. Now we're so we're so curious. From, where are you from? Texas, Abby? From Maine. Loretta. Born and raised in New York City. Born and raised in New York City. <laughs> Missouri. Missouri. Um, so another inland folk. Um, okay, thank you for participating. Um, what about and you? I grew up in San Diego, California. It's about 135 miles away. Yeah. Roughly. 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 Um, okay. Thank you guys for coming. Matisse, take it away. Thank you for being here. Thank you all for having me. That was fun. I would, I will say Chicago's the best city. In, uh, what? what? Best, yeah. greatest. best greatest. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so um, as Dan said, I do currently work in an organization that works in funding and philanthropic in the philanthropic space. So I do understand outcome-based <laughs> funding and why he has to keep that sign-up sheet over there and report back to his funders. But that won't be the bulk of my talk. It really is using a series of images to interact with you to give you a sense of why people and places are really critical to engaging in environmental issues. So recognizing the theme of engagement, I can't help but start with one question. How many oceans are there? Anyone willing to stand up and say? I see some I see some fingers counting. One, two. Say it again. How many oceans are there? Four. Depends on I hear four. I hear seven. Who's willing to actually stand and commit what? to the answer? How many oceans Daniel Cook. are there? No one? Oh, Josiah. I mean, well then there's there's three. It's the Pacific, the Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean. And the Arctic. Four. Wrong. Oh. 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 Does this picture? <laughs> does this picture? Does this image help? So the first image was of our blue planet, which was the first hint. But this image lays it out. There's one ocean. Oh, Finn, you're right. But he wasn't willing to commit. He was not convinced. He's <laughs> shy. 
So beside, beside the topic of en engagement, the reason why I start every single talk I give with that question is because it's what drives my engagement and how I got into this, to, into this field. Because it's really critical to understand the connectivity of everything we do and the connectivity t between us and the ocean, the ocean, the one ocean. Every day, every action we take or don't take has some implication for the ocean. Actually, every other breath we take is because of the ocean. Every other breath. Imagine holding your breath every other time. Let's try it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and the, it covers 71% of the planet, but also most of the population of the planet depends on the ocean for protein, so besides, beside ox oxygen, just to survive, but for protein, for water supply. Many of our pharmaceutical um, discoveries were based on ocean discoveries. And so we are actually directly tied to the ocean. And I'd like to argue that every state is a coastal state. But so yes, I'm from <laughs> inland here. And I've already given away, but this is the Chicago skyline. <laughs> <laughs> and it's on a Great Lake, so a huge body of water. But this is where I started my career. And I was fortunate enough to have a mother as an educator. But we struggled. She was a single parent. I was an only child. And as an educator, she spent days working multiple jobs. She'd sit me in the kitchen, and we'd do my spelling words and magnets on the <laughs> fridge. And the only thing I could watch for a Discovery Channel, PBS, <laughs> I mean, she's an educator. <laughs> Every word I asked help to spell, I had to sound it out, you know, and I look it up in a dictionary. So fine. But she'd argue that I started wanting to be what I am today at four. Because I jumped off one of these piers. <laughs> <laughs> she was walking along, looking at a newspaper, trying to find a job. Because as a single parent, she was constantly working to help support me. And I jumped. Fortunately, she was holding my hand. And it wasn't that I was one of those kids that just liked to splash around and play in the water. I saw something swim by. I was curious. I wanted to know. And so I started then. And before she knew it, I was always watching Jacques Cousteau or some special on Discovery Channel. And she recognized then, she claims, I have no memory of this, <laughs> that that's when she knew I wanted to do something related to water. And, but she didn't know it was the ocean. I didn't know it was the ocean. But fortunately for me, not quite, you can't quite see it in that picture, but on the other side of this body of water was the Shedd Aquarium. <laughs> it's because of a place. So this was my first place. This is where I found myself. I started going just as a resident, you know, loving to go every time when my mother said, so what do you want to do this weekend? Let's go to the Shedd, let's go to the Shedd. And then I finally, in school, the Shedd Aquarium has plenty of youth programs. I started just doing the programs at the Shed. I would volunteer. I started taking their marine science course at the Shed Aquarium. So this was my place. And this is where I first learned, truly learned, that the ocean is connected to all of this. So even though I'm in this inland place, I'm in an urban environment, I have this lake that's mostly dirty and I will not swim in it. <laughs> it's, all, it's all really connected. So what did I do? I left. <laughs> <laughs> I left Chicago to find out more. And I ended up going to the East Coast. And as Dan started to, to mention, I did undergrad work first in Rhode Island, the smallest state in the union, but also the ocean state. And at the time, I didn't think about it. But now it's kind of cool. <laughs> I left Chicago to go to the ocean state to really understand what's this all about. So. Aquatic biology was my, was my major, and I worked with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, and I got to go out on NOAA vessels, and I really started doing some of the coolest things ever. Like, one of my biggest memories on a NOAA vessel when I was still in undergrad was seeing the moon rise, because I was out at sea. There, there wasn't the kind of sort of light pollution that we see in LA, where I live now. Out at sea, you see them 
moon rise, like because there's this vast body of ocean. And then I went from there to graduate school to University of Delaware, the second smallest state of the union, which I don't know why I did that, um, but the second smallest state in the union, the first state, to just continue to build on my career. And it was in Delaware where I had the fortune to start realizing that someone else is making the decision about my work. Somewhere else, someone's deciding how much money my research should get, how that re research should be applied, <laughs> who does what with this information. And so I didn't want to just finish my dissertation, put it in a nice bound book to go on my shelf. I started asking questions like, what, what implications does this science have? All the people around me, so I studied blue crab, just to give you a little background. My research was related to population dynamics of the blue crab and the implications for that fishery. And the blue crab fishery in Delmarva, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia area, is the, one of the major economic engines in that region. So beside, besides tourism, it's that fishery. And so based on the science that I was collecting, I wanted to know, how does this affect all the fishermen that are out there? How does this affect people? And who decides? So I s was fortunate that University of Delaware has a really strong marine policy program. So I first got to sit in on this one policy class here, one policy class there. But I was on the science campus that was miles, a completely different town from the main campus. So I became this weird policy person on the science <laughs> campus because I was asking these questions. And I started to even challenge my advisor and my, my research committee saying, we really need to incorporate some of this in a more dynamic way. There's a science policy nexus that we're missing because it has implications for all the people that live here in this, in this place that depend on this resource in some way. Um, so after a while, they gave me some concessions. I finished my degree and I started doing more policy programs and going off when I was in a research season doing some policy work. And I ultimately realized that my science can help me go places like this. So this is the deep sea. So I have been to all seven continents, but also the seafloor. So I spent some time doing research on the seafloor, but my main job when I was on this research vessel actually out in, Wait, so this Alvin? is the Alvin. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> that is so unbelievably cool. <laughs> so I was um, on a Woods Hole vessel, but we were off the coast of Costa Rica, and I got oh. to go down in the Alvin. So I'd been out to Hui on the East Coast, and now I'm out in Costa, Costa Rica doing research. But when I joined this cruise, I asked, I wanted to be the nexus. So I was the scientist on board <laughs> translating the science. Like there are all these people out here saying, oh, that's so cool, but I have no idea why. <laughs> why is that so cool? The deep sea hasn't been explored by most, right? We've, we've explored, in case you don't know, the moon more than we've explored the ocean. We're looking for new planets more than we're spending time preserving this one. And this planet depends on this ocean. So even going <coughs> to the deep sea, I realized, wow. So all of that we're doing up there on land, all of that we're doing at the coast and on the surface impacts two miles deep. And so my science, again, through the science work I was doing, I was realizing there's some connection all of the, the work I'm doing is about creating connectivity and making sure people understand the implications of our decisions to do something or not do something. And took me here, you already, spoiler, <laughs> to the Antarctic, to Antarctica, um, spending time out there. And I was, I was doing research, plankton toes, <laughs> counting larvae, doing the science, but being out there still makes me recognize so the changes we're seeing here, far away, is because of everything we're all doing. We're all doing as a race. And so it finally, finally landed me here. 
Do you recognize here? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone recognize? This is not Sacramento. <laughs> so I spend plenty of time there as well. Capitol Hill. And the weird thing is I became the weird science person in the policy space. <laughs> I became the resident scientist, whereas before I was the resident policy maker and a policy person. And people will come in and ask me completely random scientific questions just because I was the one scientist in the office. I'm not sure about the answer, but my training will allow me to <laughs> find the answer. Right? I, the training you get going through graduate work still allowed me to, to find the answers, but more importantly, I learn the connectivity of the various decisions that are being made. So I would say I might have learned the most working on Capitol Hill. And there are a few things I found out. There's no right answer. There's no right answer. <laughs> you just have to do the best you can with what you have. But there are a lot of factors. And science is a small part of it. You hear things like science-based management, science-based decision making. But science is a small part of the decisions that are made. There are lots of politics. There's plenty of money being thrown around. Lots of horse trading over, literally horse trading. So I didn't say, I didn't mean to say that on purpose, but now that I've said it, literally horse trading. I was the ocean per staffer, so as a fellow, and I also had to fight over horse meat with another <laughs> office in order to get them to support the work we were doing on an ocean issue. <clears throat> The trading has nothing, they don't necessarily have to do with any, each other. It's, this is our priority. Sam Farr is an ocean champion. Here are the things he wants us to achieve for him. Okay, well, my priority is to stop horse meat, horse slaughter in Texas. And it, that's true, so I didn't meet no, I know. in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so I found myself talking to lots of animal rights advocates in order to get something else passed. So the point is, I realize it's all connected. But one of the biggest drivers of policy action, so besides, besides money, there's lots of money being thrown around, are people, constituents, who care about their place. So as a representative of Sam Farr's office, I was beholden to his district, the people who live in his district. So that, for those, he's retired now. But it was Monterey, Santa Cruz, San Benito County, th those Big areas. Sir. Big Sur, that was Sam's district. So I might have broken the record, I don't know, maybe it's been broken, of the times that I traveled to the district as a fellow. Because I recognize early, people need to know who I am if they're calling me. And they need to see if I actually care or not. Right? So being able to call me and say, Latisse, blah, 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 blah. And for me to be able to call the, um, harbor master and say on a first name basis, okay, there's this thing coming, you're going to hate it, but let's work together now. You know, it's all about people because they care about their place. They don't necessarily acknowledge that all those places are connected. Sam will have to fight with the district just south of him and the district just north of him, but it's, the decisions are still based on people and the place they care about. And if you can convince them that the thing they care about, that place, or their family members, have a broader implication, you will get them to engage. And I will say that's true for all of you. You might be learning in these courses, science and management, a mix of words. But the only reason you make a decision about certain things is because you care. And typically, for most people, it's because of their connection to, a per, to some people or to a place. There's some story behind why they're doing what they're doing. And the same is true in Capitol Hill. It might seem on its head right now. <laughs> might seem. <laughs> to some, and I'd like to argue, Sean heard me say this earlier, that one of the biggest wins in the 2016 election is that people started to recognize their own personal role in policy. And it's both action and inaction that makes a difference in policy. 
You can show up to the polls or you can sit out. Sitting out of voting is a vote. And I, I admit personally, the very next morning after the election, so side note, I hosted an election night party at my house. <laughs> <laughs> it was a hard night. <laughs> but politics aside, the next morning, one thing I could say was, well, at least I'm in California. <laughs> And people went to the streets protesting, protesting. I had a really hard time. I could not join the protest initially. I was angry at the number of people in the street who hadn't even registered to vote. I was angry. <laughs> because, one, I didn't know if this was just going to be a thing and it'll fade away. And it seems like it's not fading away. But two, how dare you? No judgment to any of you, but how dare you? So what I <laughs> recognize is now all those people who I wanted to walk up and say, I, I, how dare you, is that now they know better. To me, that's a win. So now I've joined some protests, climate march here, science, because now I recognize <laughs> that, oh, so you all get it. We were always, always part of this. You elect people who make decisions on your behalf or ignore you completely. And you have a say in that. So I'd say this was my learning platform, sort of my battleground, and DC was just, it's, it's still very rich. I spent most of my time in, in the federal space, and I've only been in California now for four years. So, so again, um, just using some of these images to sort of reiterate that engagement starts with people and a connection to a place, typically. And so I went on to another sort of place-based kind of dynamic. I went on to work for the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation and the NOAA Sanctuary. So all of my work and advocacy on behalf of these, this sanctuary system, so as managed as a system, is that I could go to those individual places. I could fly to Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary or Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary and talk to the people in those communities and say, hey, you have this great place off your shores, and here's why you should engage to protect it. Here's why it matters. If you're a fisherman, or you just like going kayaking, or you're you know, hanging out at the beach, or you're somewhat inland, like here are all the reasons that protecting special places matter to you. Just name your issue, and I bet you I can tell you why. Let's try it. Name your issue. Why <laughs> some of these places matter to you, why the ocean matters to you. You can be... Um, no matter where you are, so that you can find a connection to, to these places. So I spent time doing sanctuaries work, and then I went to Monterey Bay Aquarium. <laughs> the place to do this kind of work. The best thing about working at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, let me see if I can narrow it down to just one. <laughs> but the best thing is that it had a place. It was rooted in, in a place. So all the great stories I could tell to people about the importance of the ocean, just, just outside that window, I was able to show them in that place. I toured policymakers and funders and others saying, let's just start by saying, oh, look at the otters. I'm wearing an otter shirt every time. <laughs> Warm fuzzies. Warm and fuzzies, right? You can start with the warm and fuzzies. It, it creates rapport, right? It gets people to just drop their defenses and take a moment to think about all the things they care. It also helped that Julie Packard is the executive director and just walking into an office in Sacramento and saying, so I work for Julie Packard. <laughs> that literally happened one day. <laughs> Maybe just a little context, why, yeah. why might that so happen? So Ju Julie Packard um, is, an icon in her, herself. She's an ocean champion herself. So Julie Packard is the daughter of David Packard. So the Packard, she's an heiress of the Packard world. Um, of Hewlett Packard. Hewlett and Packard, but now separate Hewlett Packard. Um, but together, the, so that Pac Hewlett Packard, the HPs you see, she comes from that dynasty. And they have their own foundation, Packard Foundation. But Julie's a marine biologist. She still drives around in a Prius, one that she bought many years ago. She's pretty down to earth. Her father 
designed some of the ex original exhibits. She and her sister and some friends just sat around one day and said, we should tell the story of this bay here. How do we tell that story? And they bought a cannery. And after the sardine fishery there collapsed, Monterey Bay, the bay, basically died. Otters were being hunted for their fur. The whales were being entangled from all the sardine fisheries, the sardine fishery crash. Every, it's a living resource, and all of it was raped <laughs> and pulled out of the ocean. And it basically died. So there was a concerted effort over decades to rebuild Monterey Bay, the ecosystem. And it's because all those things are connected. One resource was pulled out, which pulled out seafood supply for the higher level animals. And there was just chain reaction because it really shows how everything is connected. And as it started, to, as it was starting to come back, there was this idea: well, we should tell this story. We should capture it in some way. And Monterey Bay Aquarium was born now more than 30 years ago. And Julie's been the executive director since the day it opened. And again, with her background in marine biology, and she's truly passionate about these issues, she's been an ocean champion all along. She's actually been in engaged in these issues. And it doesn't hurt that she can throw down millions of dollars on top of it <laughs> to say, and by the way, I support this. Here's a check. Um, <laughs> and so just having a place, so going back to the original story, having a place to connect people to. So I, though I was doing policy work, it was great to have a full marketing team behind me and a development staff behind me and all these folks and all the millions of people coming in to this place. And I forgot to show my other videos because I've gotten so into it, but we'll go back. Um, and it just really helped tell this story of connectivity and why people should care and why places are, are so important. And now I'm here. Recognize this coastal city? <laughs> Barely. Barely. It's all that white stuff. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is Los Angeles, for those who don't know. Uh, and I actually purposely, instead of putting a coastal shot, I chose this one because it's land to sea. Again, technically it's a coastal city, but every state's a coastal city. There's a watershed. It's all connected. So I'm now in Los Angeles, and what I'm doing now in Los Angeles is I work for Resources Legacy Fund. And what we do is we act as an intermediary between these big foundations, like Packer Foundation or Moore Foundation and others, these big spenders who want to support conservation work, who want to help with ocean conservation or other issues, um, but don't necessarily have the expertise or the capacity to really think about the best strategies. So Resources Legacy Fund provides uh, d both direction to these funders. They might come to us and say, here's what we want to achieve, and we develop a strategy. So our staff includes uh, scientists, lawyers, policy experts, a mix of consultants, basically, that work with these donors and say, you have all these millions of dollars you'd like to spend. Let us help you develop a strategy for actually achieving that money, I mean, achieving the outcome with your money. Uh, because what I've also learned, both in Capitol Hill and definitely now in the philanthropic spaces, lots of money goes to waste. So I used to, you used to think, when it comes down to it, it's just about money. If you have the money, you can achieve anything. If you have the money, the sky's the limit. It's just not true. Plenty of organizations or individuals spend money, and for goodness sake, our government for sure, we spend money in ways that don't step back and think about what's the outcome we're trying to achieve. Is it a policy action? Is it to revive a community? What's the outcome? And how should that money be directed in a way that's more effective and efficient to achieve those outcomes long term? Not an immediate win, right here, right now, we did this one thing, but long term. And so that's the kind of work I do now at Resources Legacy Fund, recognizing that even with the money, we have to step back and think about What's the place that's going to make people care? Who are the people that are engaged in this? What are the outcomes? Because the story really is that 
we're all connected to these places and the money can go to waste. Uh, so that's the kind of work I do in Los Angeles. So my office is now in downtown Los Angeles instead of on the Monterey Bay <laughs> <laughs> where I literally could see whales. Breach from my, like there's another one. Oh. It's all connected. And it was, all, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's all connected uh. and I do miss it sometimes. Um, but it is. So, so that's where I am and that's what I'm doing. And so quickly, just I'm not going to talk about any, I just wanted to show. So I work on a variety of issues. Climate change, it's all connected. You can see that, right? I mean, so it really is the visuals to, in each thing you, you're working on, no matter what it is, just getting a sense that everything's connected. Climate is an ocean issue. The ocean is what drives the climate system. It's what sucks up, the, it's the largest carbon sink on the planet. It is being affected by climate change that's driving the rest of the system. Same with, I brought a more local one. The state managed marine protected areas, the premise for creating the state managed prote protected areas was that it's a network because there's some kind of connectivity. Species go from one place to the next place and it needs protection. A fi I've worked on fisheries. Again, just an image to say, and it's all connected. <laughs> The U.S. imports 90% of our fish from overseas. It's connected. What they're doing in other countries affects our, the sustainability of the fish we eat here. <laughs> the, the water system, the water we drink, we use most of the water come, you know, the ocean. It's connected. There's a water cycle. Um, so again, I just tried to find images that, that continues to reiterate this need for connecting and watersheds, I talked about that some. Upstream all the way eventually out, out to sea. And plastics is another issue that I've, I've worked on and, and many others. Um, plastic pollution is starting to get a lot more um, attention after decades. But one of the biggest takeaways I say for plastic pollution is that once it's in the ocean, it's in the ocean. <laughs> so that's it, is there, is there, practically forever and it's just going to continue to break down. So every time we use a straw for 10 seconds, it could be in the ocean for 200 years or three or four. <laughs> like it'll just keep <laughs> breaking down. And these are hard decisions we have to make every day. It's really hard to know all this stuff because every decision it's not quite right, right? Every decision is not quite right. Mm -hmm. So even if we completely move to solar energy, some place, some place, those panels have to go, some species being displaced. Even if we move to wind energy, some bird might be threatened. They're just trying to make the best decisions if you continue to think about the connectivity of it, of it all. And since I forgot to show earlier videos, I wonder if I can. Yeah, I think you just had to escape. Go back. Um, so I'll first play this one. <clears throat> Sorry, I only had a plastic. Man, what was the world like before all this junk? <laughs> Who are those guys? Plastic <laughs> pollution is a big problem. We know how to fix it. The switch from single-use plastic to reusable products. Ask your grandparents how. School's in session, you whippersnapchatters. <laughs> and it's business. <laughs> Say yes to a plastic-free ocean. And I, I, I show that because as more of a tale but sometimes it's pretty. My name is Joy, and I've been living in Manhattan for the last 31 years. Several years ago, I saw a video on YouTube. I canceled it. No, Joy, we don't want that. <laughs> Sorry, Joy. Um, I, only, I raised that example in particular because plastic, of, of many of the other issues that I've worked on, is tangible. We called it the sort of gateway drug to ocean conservation. It's so tangible. People can't just make a decision. I won't use this, I will use that. And they can directly affect some of the outcomes. And so for them, I've worked 
quite a bit on the, the plastic bag ban across the state, recognizing it's just a small step and a blip. But it really was to get more people engaged and just seeing how they can directly interact with the environment, how they do directly interact with the environment, whereas most people don't see themselves as part of the environment, mm -hmm. as if people are somewhere over here and there's an environment, so there's an ecosystem somewhere else out there. With regard to that plastic bag ban, mm -hmm. you say you worked on it, so you know. On that ballot were two different things that had to do with plastic bags. And with the wording that's on the ballot, sometimes even I read it two or three times and still don't understand which is the one I really want to vote for. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you compensate for that? How do you get around that? Well, how did that happen in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> well, fortunately, we won them both. There was a yes on one and no on the other. How did it happen? Politics. The plastic bag industry spent, outspent the conservation side three to one in order to not only defeat the ban, but to confuse voters. So they, cre they created, <laughs> but we won. And I'll tell you why. So this is why I brought this specific example, because I think it's a really tangible example of what works and why this connectivity story is a good one. So um, just for a little background, yes, the industry, the plastic bag industry, most of these companies, that aren't, they aren't even based in California. They're in, um, not to keep picking on Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Texas, the Carolinas, other places. Came in, spent tens of millions of dollars. And they put it on as a green measure. Um, you know, if you vote for this one, We'll raise money and we'll go out and do cleanups and we'll transition to greener products. It was all greenwash. It was all made up. It was all just lies. To the point of we brought in lawyers like, can they actually just vote case lie the way? This is it's not even true. So it was politics. They didn't want to. The profits were threatened. California is a huge state. Lots of plastic bags being used in California. They did not want to lose that profit margin. So that's how it happened. So in this campaign. Yes, I'm 67, no, I'm 65. <laughs> it got confusing. We used our platform at the aquarium, recognizing people are going to be so confused by this, but we are able to touch millions of people through social media every time they walk through this door. All we need to do is just try to make it clear. Let's just beat it into folks what they should do. And we were, all the staff had to wear buttons that made it clear. We put up a new exhibit. We ran videos like this at park gatherings and a variety of uh, avenues or venues. Julie Packard signed the ballot measure because we knew people would recognize her name and say, oh, Julie said I should do this, so I'm going to do this. So we took everything in our arsenal just to prove a point. If people engage, we win. Now. We're currently standing on our heads in this administration. Engagement is different. You can't just bring all the grassroots people, millions and millions of folks to send in comments, come to rallies and go, and now our policymakers are going to do exactly what we asked them to do. Not that they ever did that before, but it was more likely that that's what would happen. There are different strategies that are needed now. Who are those policymakers donors? Who are their neighbors? How can we shame them in the airport? <laughs> but it really, again, but it's because we can connect with those people directly. And the plastic bag ban was just an example. Again, plastic pollution issue is a much bigger issue than plastic bags in a specific state. But it's the trickle out effect to get people to understand that they're directly connected to these issues. And this is how you can engage that you actually are obligated to engage. Not only is it your right, your responsibility, your obligation to engage in some of these decisions. Do you have a question? Yeah. And yeah. So <laughs> I was just I was wondering if like you had any say in uh, what the Maui City Council did the past two days ago banning uh, plastic straws. The straw. I, I did not personally, but I do know some folks who, who worked on it. Cool. Yeah. Um, 
anyway, so that's why I stopped on this particular example. I wanted to show a video because it really is. It was the message of that video. If you happen to miss it, was really just go back to the basics. Just do what we did before. I mean, did your mother usually send you off with a plastic bag? To no. It's a paper bag. <laughs> Most community mm -hmm. or a reusable one because we just grabbed some bags. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or a lunch yeah. bag. Something reusable. That's the point. You didn't grab before a plastic water bottle and a, all those things are new, <laughs> relatively new. Um, so if you just take a moment to go back to the basics and think about how we connect it to all of this, maybe we can start making some changes. But it will take a lot more work and a lot more time. But I just wanted to sh show that example. And so I'm going to peel back out just for a minute as a reminder. And I think the video link is on here. Just as a reminder that there's one ocean, one of my favorite video, uh, PSAs of all time, I want to share. Has anyone seen that before? No. It's a California-based campaign. It's been around, at, I think, at least 10 years now. But the message is simple. Every person in that video recognized that they're dependent, not only connected, but dependent on the ocean. For one reason or another, food, water, et cetera, air, relaxation, just serenity, just sitting on the beach on the coast. And so I, I still turn to that PSA because it really captures what I'm trying to say. And one of, my, one of my first actions at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, just as an example, uh, the mission statement reads, to inspire conservation of the ocean. It used to say, to inspire conservation of the oceans. The day I walked in, it's the one thing I wanted to change. We can ban plastic bags, we can engage all these people, we can make great videos, but as the number one aquarium in the world, <laughs> as the hub for where all these folks come in and get an understanding about conservation, they need to walk out knowing it's connected. So if they think they can go back to their ocean on the East Coast or their ocean somewhere in Europe and do whatever they want there and have no effect anywhere else, we've lost. So if before I leave, I do nothing else but take that S off the wall, <laughs> that's a win because it's what keeps me going and I want you to walk out of here knowing that all of you can be an ocean champion. Every person can be an ocean champion, no matter your, your passion. Filmmakers, scientists, of course, policy folks, dancers, dancers. True story. A dancer came to the aquarium and said, I'm making an ocean choreo choreography piece. OK. <laughs> and I'm going to capture your voices and tell me good stories and I'm going to choreograph a piece based on that she came to the aquarium and Bari other places and now her piece is featured at the Smithsonian and it's background quotes from some of us researchers saying this connection and that issue and blah 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 and it's a beautiful piece I mean of course you can imagine flowy 
blues and greens and things like that. She's an ocean champion and she's a dancer. Her name was Fran, I will look up her last name. She's based in, I think, Santa Cruz. But I'll look it up. So it's like, I've never heard of this person. Who, who are you? OK. Um, but I, I'll look it up, and I'll share, share with Dan. But the point is, every person can be an ocean champion, especially if they understand their connection to it. No matter what you do in your careers and in your fields, no matter what you do ultimately as parents, no matter what you do as citizens, you are connected to the ocean. My kids now know it, so for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. They now <laughs> recognize quite a bit just from me, but I want you to walk away just knowing that engagement on environmental issues, stewardship, whatever it is, it starts with you recognizing that we are all connected, no matter our political backgrounds, no matter where we live, because of the ocean. And so with that, I want you not to forget that. Mm -hmm. So zooming all the way back out to my first slide, we live on a blue planet. <coughs> this is planet blue, the blue marble. And until Elon Musk or someone really ramps it up, this is all we have. <laughs> this is also our one planet. And so I encourage you to keep asking hard questions, keep working with each other, keep being interdisciplinary, because that's really what it takes. Every person, every university, every science lab, every funder, every policymaker, we all have some role in this. All of us in making sure we keep this. We're the problem. Mm -hmm. We're also the solution. It's kind of hard, though. Mm -hmm. And it would take a fight. But thanks for having me. And.